every opportunity you can. I know some of you are maybe from out of town visiting relatives. I have my brother Stephen J. Gates here. We look a lot alike except for he's more of me than he's a, got more volume to him than, than me. He's my older brother and uh, he came down uh, for the inauguration of our building. So uh, I thought that's, he probably would get the uh, prize for the one that's come the farthest. But um, many of you know that he lost his wife less than two months ago. She had an accident and passed away. So uh, we've been praying for him and just appreciate his coming, being here with us. So, okay. Um, we have open house, as, as Ken mentioned, from 2 to 4 today, and then we'll have a recognition service at 4, and right after we'll have our evening devotional. And for you that weren't able to be here uh, the weekend we took pictures, uh, Pat Pierce is going to be taking pictures right after our Bible classes today, and then during the open house. So if you haven't had your picture taken for our new directory, or maybe you're not yet, you're a member of the church, but you're not a member of this congregation, but you want to be, this is a good time to step up and let us know that you want to be so you can get your picture in and we'll uh, help you through that process as well, okay? Uh, if you would, uh, Ken also mentioned about filling out this card there in front of you in the back of the pew. And uh, we have a little box back there on the table beside the contribution box. You can put it in there or give it to me or to Keith and we'd really appreciate that. Um, also, as Ken mentioned, you can text Welcome, the word welcome, 615-857-0102 and get connected with Highland Heights here. Uh, many of you knew uh, Travis Irvin or know Travis, uh, one of the greatest men I, I know. I, I just admire him so much, but he's got cancer again and so many of us sent him cards and he sent me this thank you. He, he wanted to make sure that I shared this with you all. and it's so. He wrote, it's not an everyday occurrence for me to receive get well cards from people I don't know. And yet I've been receiving several cards from several of you at Highland Heights Church. Thank you for taking time to send these. Thank you for the encouraging thoughts and notes you write inside the cards. And thank you for thinking of me and praying for me. The last time I fought cancer was five years ago and I started each day reading the cards that were sent to me. It was and still is a great way to start a day knowing someone cares enough to express their thoughts and care. Thank you again, Travis Irwin, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So uh, we want to continue to pray for Travis. Uh, it, things are not looking really good for him. And uh, he's, he's been a blessing to the church all over the United States. And, and I just appreciate so much him. So um, Recently, Brad Harab, who is the editor-in-chief of Focus Press or, or the Think Magazine and founder of uh, Focus Press asked me uh, to speak on the subject of forty or to write on the subject of fortifying your faith. Uh, this magazine, if you don't receive it, it comes out once a month and it, it talks about current issues but with a Christian viewpoint and you'd really enjoy it if, if you don't get it. You can go to into the website, just type in Focus Press or Think Magazine and you can find out how you can subscribe to the to this magazine, but uh, fortifying your faith. You know, we're, we're used to fortifying a lot of things. Uh, our cereals are all fortified, right? With stuff we don't even know what they are. Vitamin A, C, E, iron, B complex, vitamins, niacin, folic acid, riboflavin, thiamine, B6, and B12 added. <laughs> I don't know if there's any room in the box for anything else, but <laughs> there, we're used to things being fortified. Our milk. Uh, forever has been fortified with vitamin D and now all other kinds of things as well. Uh, my favorite are the fortified vitamin donuts. Uh, they didn't last long. They came out in the 40s and people kind of suspected they really weren't all that healthy so they ended up. But uh, So how do we fortify our faith? How do we fortify our faith? Now you, Maybe you never thought about we need to fortify our faith or make our faith stronger. You either have it or you don't kind of way we think. It's kind of like a married couple. They think, well, we either love each other or we don't. We can't help. The, we, we just fell in love and I guess we could fall out of love. We just don't have any um, responsibility or, or nothing, any control of, of what we feel. But faith is, is, is different. It's, it's like love is, is a decision, it's not a feeling. If you decide to love your spouse, do what's best for them, even above your own interests, 
Good feelings will come eventually. <laughs> Maybe you don't, uh, during that day or at that moment, that time you may not feel good, but you act out of love. And faith is kind of like that too. It's, it's not a feeling like, oh, I just feel God in my heart or I just feel God's presence or I can just, no, we know, we know uh, intellectually, you don't have to be a rocket scientist uh, to know that this world couldn't happen on its own. There had to be a creator. It's so intricate, so well designed. Uh, I've talked about this many times, but uh, one of the world's most famous atheists, Anthony Flew, uh, back in the 70s, he debated our brother Thomas Warren in Denton, Texas, so four days down there in the fall at about 75. And uh, at the beginning uh, of that debate, Anthony Flew, being the world's most renowned atheist, a British gentleman, at the end of those four nights, he said, well, I guess I'm not an atheist. I guess I'm agnostic. Because he went from the position where I know there's no God to where now I'm not sure. <laughs> and before he died, he started writing books where he became an creationist. He believes, he says, there's no other explanation that all this could happen if there weren't a, a creator. Now, he didn't necessarily, be, he didn't become a Christian. He died before, but he moved from an atheist to a person that honestly had to accept the fact there's no other explanation. There's no other possibility. And so, faith is, uh, is based on reason, it's based on logic, although some fake scientists sometimes say that we just come from monkeys and we just happened out of nothing and, and that's the popular view and if you repeat a lie enough, people begin to believe that as truth. But, but we know that there's a God and the Bible tells us who this God is and what, what He wants from us. Uh, but our faith is a decision that we, we trust, we believe, and, and, we, and feelings will come if we make those decisions and put our lives in God's hands. So how do we fortify uh, our faith? Well, I want to ask four questions before we answer this fifth question. First, uh, there are these questions that I want to ask about faith or, is what is faith? You know, we just throw that word around. It's a very religious word. So what is faith? And then, then we're going to answer the question, why is faith so important? What's, what's the big deal about faith? The Bible talks a lot about that. And then the third question we're going to ask, are there different levels or different intensities or, or are there different degrees of faith? You know, you either have it or you don't, right? We'll, we'll answer that question. And then number four, what are some things that hinder or possibly even destroy our faith? You know, it doesn't necessarily, we're, we're responsible for our faith. And there are things that we can do that will destroy our faith and things that we can do to, to fortify faith, our faith. And then the last question we'll answer, what are things that fortify or strengthen our faith, okay? So first of all, what is faith? Well, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. And it was read, Nolan read so well for us here. Uh, but faith is... Verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Okay? It's a trust. I may not see it, but if God said it, I believe it. It may not even make sense to me, but if God said it, I know it's true. Faith is trust. It's not a feeling. It's, it's a trust, and it's and it's displayed and it's evidenced by our obedience to God. And so if you read through this, the rest of this chapter of Hebrews chapter 11, you'll see that God gives us, we call this the hall of fame of faith. And he talks about various people throughout uh, the Bible history uh, that obeyed God and that were rewarded uh, because of their faith. They obeyed God because of faith, even difficult times, even times when they didn't understand why and what was happening. And so uh, they trusted, and their evidence of their faith was that they obeyed. They, they uh, submitted their will to God's will. But the second question we want to ask is, why is faith so important? Okay? It's just kind of a religious word. Well, okay, we know it's trust, but what's the big deal about faith? Well, it's a big deal. Let me, first of all, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, as Nolan read, and without faith... It's impossible to please him, talking about God. For whoever would draw near to God must, well, pay attention, must believe one, 
that he not only exists, but that he rewards those who seek him, okay? God wants you to know that he loves you and he wants to bless your life and he wants you to trust him. And, and I, I remember when I first became a Christian, I, I knew enough about the Bible that I knew that if I didn't become a Christian, I was going to be in hell for eternity. And that's not a popular word, not a popular principle, but I, I knew that was true. And I wasn't living a life and I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to become a Christian. I know it's going to be boring. What are, not, what are we going to be? Able, nothing. You're not allowed to do anything. That's not true. God wants to bless you. He wants to reward you because you're seeking Him. And it's happened in my life far beyond anything I could have ever imagined. So faith is important because you can't please God without faith. It's, and the second reason that faith is so important, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, explains to us, for by grace you have been saved. You don't have to be a Christian very long to know, obviously it was by grace, because none of us are, are worthy of, of God's salvation, of the blood of Jesus. Of, we know that from experience. We try, we try to do our best, and we're always going to try. Until Jesus comes back or until we die, we're going to try our best to be like Jesus, okay? But we still know how much we fail and how frail we are and how the struggles we have on the inside. So we're saved by grace. He says, you have been saved, or for by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith is the, is, is the door God has given us to enter into uh, His presence, into, into a relationship with Him, a, a grace-filled relationship with Him. But it's open to those that, that trust Him, that believe His Word, that act upon that. And, and the Bible says, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You know, a lot of people, people have the ideas that if you're just good enough, you at least just do enough good things, at least a few more than the bad things you've done, then that's all it takes. You know, all these surveys that have been done over the years, people on the street, you know, they ask, if you died, would you go to heaven? Practically everybody says yes. Because everybody thinks they've done something good. You know, I helped my grandmother out one day. You know, I fixed her car. Or, you know, everybody has done something good. The most evil person you could think of one moment in their life did some good deed. But the problem is it's just the opposite. If we've done one bad deed, in which we all have, if you've come to an age where you can understand what's right and wrong, you've, you've thought something you shouldn't have thought, you did something, you said something, or you didn't do something you should have done. Usually people will just think of all the bad stuff you, sh you shouldn't be doing. But there's all kinds of good things like putting Jesus first in your life and letting Him be Lord of your life. If you're not doing that, that's the worst sin of all you could commit. And so no one is saved by works, but by God's grace. But He gives us that grace through the avenue of faith, okay? Now, number three, are there different degrees of faith? Well, you just have it or you don't, right? I've got faith, but that's really not what the Bible says. We can have a little faith, or we can have a lot of faith, okay? Let's look in this passage here in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 8. And I want to read verses 23 through 27. Matthew chapter, 20, Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. Now, Jesus uh, had called his disciples and little by little, he's revealing to them who he is. OK, he didn't just the first day say, hey, come follow me. I'm God in the flesh. They weren't prepared for something like that. Uh, like uh, little children, you know, if they ask about, well, this one little girl asked her mom, mom, where did I come from? And. And the mother was kind of felt like it was very awkward and thought, well, I've got to tell her about the birds and bees sometime. And she went through this long explanation and her daughters kind of said, oh, because Sally said she came from Pennsylvania, you know. <laughs> so sometimes people are not ready to hear certain things. And so the disciples weren't ready to hear yet that Jesus is God in the flesh. But little by little, he's living with them, walking with them. They're camping out. He's teaching them and he's showing them through the miracles that he's performing that he's not just a prophet. 
He is God in the flesh. But at this moment, they, they haven't got to that point yet to really understand who he is. So Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, the Bible says, And when he got into his, in the boat, Jesus, when Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Okay, that's what, they're, that's what disciples do. They follow their master or their, their teacher. And uh, they learn from him. They live with him. They didn't have a, a classroom where they went and, from, you know, nine to five every day. They, 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 they followed him to, to learn what he does. And verse 24 says, And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he, Jesus, was asleep. Sounds kind of strange to me. Why would you be asleep during the storm? Well, he's not worried about this. And if you go back and see all the things that Jesus did, and, uh, you know, he was tired. So in verse 25, the Bible says, And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord. We are perishing. Okay, they're scared, scared to death. Verse 26, And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. It's like, I've done all these miracles. You've seen them? And you forget I'm here in the boat with you? Why are you afraid? But we're all like that. They're not, they're not any worse than we are. We're all afraid. God has taken care of us for years and still we let some things bother us. We let some things just tear us up. Oh, what if there's going to be a peanut butter shortage at the end of the year? What are we going to do? You know, the news comes out with all this stuff and gets people worked up and scared and God's still taking care of us. So Jesus said, oh, you of little faith. So faith has degrees. You can have a lot of faith, little faith, strong faith, weak faith. And then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. Think about it. They're in the storm. Jesus is their, you know, their teacher, their leader. They've seen him do great things, but they're afraid. And then he gets up and calms the storm. First of all, he's doing this as much as anything to teach them who he is and to calm their hearts and to teach them faith and have their faith grow. Verse 27, and the men marveled saying, what sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? Okay, so he had little faith. Let's look at somebody who had a lot of faith. Turn in your Bible now to uh, Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. We'll read verse 23 and 24. This is uh, a, a man that... Uh, I mean, Matthew. Okay. This is a man who had a son who was possessed by a demon. Now, demon possession was something we don't have today. Although Satan can dominate somebody's life because they allow them to, not be against the will. But there was a period of time uh, in the Bible that God permitted evil spirits to dominate people, but they were always for a purpose of so that God's Jesus or his disciples would come and expel them to prove to people once and for all that God is more powerful. Uh, 1 John 4, 4 says that the spirit in us is more powerful than the spirit of the world, okay? And so this man, uh, he was a centurion, and he comes to Jesus, and he says, uh, uh, well, let's read it. And, and Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Verse 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, but help my unbelief. Okay, so not only can we have a little bit of faith, but we're going to have a lot of doubt at the same time. Just because, you know, <clears throat> we believe something. John the Baptist, at the end of his ministry, when he was in jail about to put to death, he had his disciples go to Jesus and say, uh, Lord, are, are you really the one we've been waiting for? So our faith can waver. Our faith walk is not just always straight up. It's, it's ups and downs. But, but we need to focus on Jesus. I think I, I, I might have skipped this. Yeah, that's what I did. I skipped chapter 8. Uh, if I'll just mention here uh, chapter 8, verses 5 to 13. This is about the centurion, and his son is, is dominated by his uh, evil spirit. And, uh, and he said, no, Jesus, you don't need to come into my house. Just say it from here. Like, I have 
uh, inferior you know, or, or people under me and they obey my voice and my commands. Just say from here, you know, I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. So Jesus healed his son from a distance and Jesus uh, blessed this man saying, I've not seen in Israel anybody with, with such great a faith. And he talked about that there would be Israelites that would be expelled from the kingdom of God and yet people from the east and the west would come and be accepted in the kingdom of God because of their faith, okay? Um, I'm just kind of uh, running here a little bit fast. Okay, number four, what kind of things will destroy our faith? Well, several things. Walking by sight, not by faith. You know, people that say, well, I'm only believe it if I see it with my own eyes. Like, I'll challenge God. If he doesn't, you know, do what I say, if he doesn't take care of this problem, I'm not going to believe in him. Threaten God. People do that. Uh, also, we may focus on our failures, not on God's victories. The Bible is full from the beginning to the end, showing where God has had victory. You chosen people who are weak and uh, simplistic and yet had great victories through them. Also, fear is probably the, the exact opposite of what faith is. Fear. Uh, fear is a real feeling, okay? And God created a, the ability for us to have fear. And it has its purpose. It keeps you from jumping off of a, a cliff just for kicks, <laughs> Right? It, it makes you cautious in, in certain situations. So it, there, there's a purpose for fear, but the Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love and self-control. God doesn't want you to be fearful, but he wants you to trust in him. Uh, but probably the thing that will destroy your faith the most is just sin, okay? And sin will happen whenever you don't focus on Jesus. You start focusing on your desires, your carnal nature, what you want to do, and uh, you rebel against God. And if you live in sin, the Bible says there will be no more sacrifice for your, for your sins. Okay? You can't purposely live in sin. Now, we'll all sin, and we'll repent of that, not out of willfulness, but out of ignorance or a weakness. But we'll ask God for His blessing. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Okay? So that's the thing that will destroy your faith the most. If you're involved in sin, your heart will become hard, and your faith will be cold and, and eventually die. Okay, finishing up here, last of all, what things fortify or what things strengthen our faith? Well, there's a whole list of things, and you might want to write these down. Uh, studying the Bible. Hebrews or Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing the word. Okay? As you're meditating on the word, hearing the word. John 20, verse 30, 31. John said that Jesus did many things that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe, and by believing, have eternal life. Okay, so the Word of God produces faith in us. So you need to, to uh, feast on the Word of God. Also, reflecting on God's faithfulness and power. Uh, in the Bible, that's why we study and meditate on the Bible, see God working, but in your own life. Open your eyes, you can see God's hand in your life from the time you were, you can, uh, far back as you can remember. You, we all can see how God has taken care of us and blessed us. Also, reading Christian books, watching Christian-based movies, listening to Christian music. Now, I understand that uh, you, you have to be careful on anything, you know, in life. But certainly, rather than listening to, to music that has words that defame God or, 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 or promote uh, immorality and, or, or even raise a spirit within you that, that's carnal rather than spiritual, just you flood your life with, with good influences. Uh, pray asking for God to increase your faith. Okay? James talks about if you need wisdom, you pray and God will bless you with it. So pray and ask for faith. Uh, certainly, attending worship and Bible classes regularly. This is one of the, the best uh, sources of, of, of spiritual growth. Refocus your worship experience. Uh, we come to worship God to please Him. Too many people think, oh, you know, the church building was too cold or I didn't like the songs they sang or the preacher spoke too long or I didn't and all that. No, we're not here for us. We're here to worship God and to please Him. Uh, also, give purposefully and sacrificially. If you're not invested 
in, in the work of God and doing God's will. It, uh, the Bible talks probably more about uh, money than it does faith. Uh, it's just because it's a way you evidence your faith. And so uh, we don't want to pressure anybody. We want, the Bible says, God loves who gives cheerfully. So there are boxes back there, you do online. You can, you know, there's a lot of ways you can give. And not just here at, at, the, at the congregation, but in other ways as well. And then also develop relationships with faith-filled people. If you've, all your friends are dragging you down, you need to get new friends. And being around people that you admire that will help build your faith is a great way. And last of all, share your faith. Talk openly about God and Jesus and God's grace and mercy and His goodness wherever possible. I grew up in a home where we pretty much didn't talk about sex or God. It's just, you know, we just, those were, maybe it was the times back in those days or so, I don't know, but, but uh, it's, it's not easy to talk about your faith if you've not been accustomed to doing that. And when you do that, maybe the person wants to hear about it, maybe they don't, but it'll certainly strengthen your faith, okay? It reinforces your faith. Like with a teacher or a preacher who get more out of a sermon, more out of a class, those who are preparing and sharing, okay? Uh, so how strong is your faith? Uh, they don't have faith meters. That would be pretty cool if we could, you know, just check it out like a thermometer. So, oh, my faith is not doing very well. I need to make sure, I need to beef up my activities, my exercise. Or, or have you seen those fitness trackers? They, you know, they track your, your heartbeat, how many steps you've taken. All stuff. What if they had one about that would track your faithfulness, okay? Oh, no, you're minimal. Your faithfulness is minimal. You need to do better. Or, or maybe it's consistent. That's good. But you can, be, you can be fortified. You can be stronger. There's more you can do. So uh, I, I want to close our lesson here. Uh, mentioning here Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 14 says, Our, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against evil spirits and, and, and principalities. And we are in a spiritual warfare. And, and we have to, to do all we can to, to fortify our faith. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for blessing us far beyond anything we deserve. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your word that, that certainly produces faith in us. Help us to trust you, trust your word, Father, trust Jesus. Help us, Father, to be an encouragement one to another. Help us, Father, to understand that this life, is, is we're here to, to show you our love and, and to prepare for eternity. And so uh, strengthen our faith, Father, and take away from anything from us that would weaken our faith or, or destroy our faith. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have any needs, we ask you to come together and stand and sing.